Let's get started. Right, good morning. Um, hey, wow, Igor, you are here. You know, I always wanted to meet you in person. It's great you're here. And you know, I love AngularJS. And well, I love AngularJS 1.3 because that's what I know. Um, and I also have it on my t-shirt, so I'm really a fan of it. So, but I heard, Igor, you have been thinking about 2.0 for a while now. And so it would be awesome if we could build something together and you show me the difference between 1.3 and 2.0. What do you think? Hi, Tobias. <laughs> okay. I think there are two flaws in your proposal. First of all, Angular 2 is not finished yet. So I can show you some bits, but it's not going to be complete and things might still change. And secondly, to-do app is lame. It doesn't really reflect the complexities of real world. How about we build something else, something real? So you read my mind. Actually, I wanted to build a to-do app. Um, <laughs> what else, right? So, well, well, but you know, I have a special use case in mind. How about we build a to-do app for Santa? Because there, it's kind of different, right? He's always on his sleigh. He's always on the move. So we need a mobile app, right? And the to-do list of Santa is actually huge, right? So we have some, some good requirements, I think, there. OK, I see some scalability challenges here. Also, we have good latency requirements. Let's give it a shot. OK, so how do we start? Well, I think we should first grab uh, some nice layout in HTML and CSS and build the application based on that. OK. Do you That's have something? Yeah. Look at this. Do you like it? It's pretty cool. So, so you know, to-do list, it's a list of to-dos, right? And actually, we have three tabs to this. So there are first my to-dos, right? My wish list comes first. Then there are the good kids, and then there are the bad kids. Wait, so you built a special tab just for you so that Santa knows which to-dos are more important? Well, I built the app, right? So I can decide. <laughs> Where's my tab? Well, that's fourth something. <laughs> OK, well. Let's take this and convert this into an Angular template. Oh, that's cool. I know this. So let's start off with an Angular template for 1.3. Looks something like this, right? So you have a controller at the top. The controller is the thing that contains the state and the methods. That's easy. So then we have the input box at the top and the button where you add new to-dos. And then we have a tab container. Let's say we already have this and we can just use it because we've got components in 1.3 as well. We have the tab pane, the first, my to-dos. And in there, we have a re repeater of the to-dos. And one to-do is always, you have a checkbox that triggers the done state, right? You've got the, the title. And at the end, you have a thing to delete the to-do. Like, maybe Igor's to-do will be deleted. I don't know. <laughs> so, so that's how it would look like. So how would that look like in 2.0? Yeah, this looks pretty good. So let's convert this into an Angular 2 template. I think it will look something like this. Huh. Does it look familiar? Interesting. So, you know, okay, it's still HTML-based. I like this. Yeah, we actually like HTML-based templating quite a bit. It feels very natural for web developers and also allows web designers to participate in the development process. Additionally, the tooling is pretty good. And with the new additions uh, to browsers through web components like the template element, we are going to have better support from the browser to build this kind of templating. So we are sticking to HTML. OK, cool. So when I look at this closer, there's no ng click anymore, and there's no ng model. And what are those weird brackets around those attributes? So what's that about? Yeah, so we did several major changes to the templating language. Um, we now have generic syntax for binding to events which is, as we see, a parentheses around the attribute name. Um, this is kind of familiar from JavaScript. Whenever you want to invoke a method, use parentheses. So here we have a click, and we are saying bind to the click event. And whenever a click event happens on the right-hand side, we have an expression that needs to be executed. Does that make sense? OK. And you're saying parentheses like method invocation in JavaScript? Yeah. OK. So the next big change we have is we have a generic binding to properties of an element. And we, ex we express this using brackets uh, around the attribute name. So in this case, we have the value, which has brackets around it. And on the right-hand si right -hand side, we have an expression. So in both cases, on the right-hand side, we always have expressions. 
and this allows us to identify an expressions in a template and clearly distinguish them from string literals. Okay, and the interpolation stays as, as is? Yes, and good old interpolation remains as it was before. Okay, okay. I think it takes a while to get used to it, but I can see the benefits, right? Right, and now you can see what parts are expressions and what are not expressions. Exactly, this is one benefit. The other benefit is that we can now bind to web components out of the box. Because web components usually expose properties and events as the primary API. So having a generic syntax to bind to these will allow us to work with web components out of the box. So no wrapper directives anymore? No more ng-click, no more ng-model. Everything will just work without extra, uh, extra wrappers that I need to build. Okay, starting to like this. Let's look at this a little closer. So what is this checked attribute? I remember HTML, in HTML, the input element does not have a checked attribute. What's that? It doesn't have an attribute, but it has a property. And as I mentioned, our generic binding is to element properties, not to element attributes. This is the difference between Angular 1.3 and uh, Angular 2.0. Attributes, properties, what? That's the same, isn't it? Well, this is the DOM, right? So it's kind of weird. But <laughs> all elements have properties, and some properties are serializ serializable into attributes. And those that are are always uh, re restricted to using just a string type. Um, so we find properties to be more flexible because you, you, they have different types, and usually the API surface is bigger. So I think, in general, this is going to work better for developers. They will have more flexibility. OK, that's cool. So as we're talking about data binding, there's, we've got attributes and properties, and there's also two-way data binding, right? I, I love this. It makes simple things simple, and that's always been a part of AngularJS. So, but recently, there have been new, new thinking about this. You know, React and Flux architecture, and they say, well, we actually should do this only one way, and we should actually control the data flow. So what is your take on this? We looked into these ideas, and we actually think that they are pretty cool. Um, they can greatly simplify the understanding of large-scale applications. Um, they can allow you to estimate the impact of a code change during code review on the overall application. And they also make debugging applications simpler. So we have some pretty good ideas, uh, pretty cool ideas about what we can do in this, this area. But there are still many things to be figured out. So stay tuned, and we'll let you know what's going to happen. OK, I'm excited what's to come. So data binding, last thing in AngularJS is we do dirty checking, right? It's kind of a pull model. Do, do we keep this, or what's up with that? So dirty checking is actually pretty cool. And one thing that we realized during all of the performance work we did is that in many scenarios, it's actually the fastest way to get stuff into the, into the view. So for example, if you are rendering a brand new view, uh, dirty checking is the fastest way to get hold of the data. There is, there is no other way how you can do it faster. There are other scenarios when dirt checking is slower, and in those cases, object observe, for example, as an alternative push model is, is better. So the way we build the next generation model observation for Angular, we have um, a pluggable system that allows us to build a hybrid system so that we can take advantage of both depending on what, si what situation are we dealing with. Okay, cool. Okay, we've got the template, we've got data binding. So, so what's next? How about we add uh, shopping cart? Really? So it's a great picture. I love it. But I think it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but really? Let's just go ahead and add some logic to the template. OK. So how do we do that? In 1.3, we would create a controller, right? Yeah. But Tobias, I'm sorry to tell you that we killed the controller. <laughs> Real. Yes. Okay. So in Angular 1, we started with templates and controllers, and the component model was actually an afterthought. In Angular 2, we're embracing the component model, and we're making components the basic building block for building applications. So we don't have no need for controllers anymore. And when you think about it, the controller and the template was actually like half-baked component anyway. So why not just go all the way? Okay, components. So component directives, right? Yeah, we just create a component directive and you'll be all set. No way. You know how complicated this directive API is, right? You build it and 
it doesn't even fit on the slide. <laughs> so what, do I really have to do this every time now? Tobias, I'm sorry, but the director definition object is dead as well. <laughs> okay. So when we did our research, um, we realized that the component directive could actually look something like this. And I think Mishka showed you just in a few, min few minutes ago that we can just use a class to define uh, the, the class for the, the component, and then we can use annotation to specify that we are gonna, uh, this class is a component in Angular. Okay, that's simple, class with annotation. So you're saying that this is now the execution context for expressions. Yeah, right? so all the properties and the methods are then available in the template, so you can just bind to those. Oh, that's cool, because now my IDE can start, if given I add types to it, right? then now my IDE can start type checking my expressions in my template and can do deep analysis. Yes. It, can, it can find my typos. <laughs> Actually, yes, so that's one of our goals, to be able to better inspect templates and tell you when you're making mistakes. Wow, this is awesome. Okay, so component directive. Are there other types of directives? Yeah. When we looked into this most closely, we realized that there are actually three common scenarios when, you, when people use directives. There are component directives, just like the one we mentioned, then there are template directives like ng-repeat and ng-if, and then there are decorated directives like ng-class and ng-show, ng-height. Um, and we built annotations specific for these scenarios so that when you're building a component, you can get a head start and it's much simpler to, to start. You don't need to the large object and define all the properties. You get the right defaults out of the box and things are much simpler. Okay. Okay, this is cool. So, so we have the component now and with that's an execution context for expressions. So, so what's next? Do you think there's something missing in this slide? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, there used to be scope. Where is it? Tobias? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I'm sorry to inform you that dollar scope has passed away. OK. So now that the component is the execution context for the template, we don't need a special scope object anymore. Okay, I think I understand this. So let's see. But wait, there used to be more to dollar scope. It's not just the execution context. It's also like it used to be responsible for adding watches, and there was also event system system to it. Yeah, but we realized that if we can, if we split up all these responsibilities into three different components then actually everything becomes much simpler. Um, let's take a look at one example I brought. Well, do you know what's wrong with this example? Let's see. So, what's that? Oh yeah, you know, this took me a while to figure out when I started with AngularJS. You know, you've got this repeater, right? And the repeater stamps out a new scope for every row. When I click on a row, then it assigns the property selected user to this nested scope. And but this assignment will never show up on the top scope. So this example will actually never work. And there's a workaround, right? So you can add dollar parent, and if you have complex examples, it gets dollar parent, a dollar parent, a dollar parent, a dollar parent. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Yes, I do. But the good news is that because now the responsibilities between uh, of the evaluation context and management of watchers are split up, we no longer need this, and the original example will just work out of the box the way you would expect it. So there are gonna be no surprises in Angular 2.0. Okay, nice so far. So let's recap real quick. So we've, we've got new, new template syntax, which allows us to work with web components. That's cool. We can now check expressions in templates, like syntactic, syntactically, but also semantically, deeply, and scope is gone. This is awesome. Is there anything else for templating? Yeah, there's actually one more interesting thing that I want to bring up. Uh, let's take a look. So before, in Angular 1.3, when you wanted to use a directive, you would just register it once with the application, and then you could use it anywhere in, the, in any template in the application. In Angular 2, we actually want you to explicitly specify the directives that you want to use in a particular template, and this will allow us to do things like better checking uh, and validation of the template, as well as it will allow us to do optimizations that were not possible before. So, but that's, okay, you're saying it's more work than previously? A little bit more work, but it's not bad at all. Okay, but, but it will give me like support for, for IDEs. I can click on directives now, it could jump to the definition, 
because IDEs now know which things in a template are directives and which are not. Yeah, and a nice thing is that because uh, these this imports are scoped, we can actually avoid problems with collisions that were pretty common in, especially in scenarios where you were dealing with third-party components that had its own dependencies and would import its own things and you, that you would not know about. So you say A depends on B, which has a selector and a directive which uses C and then uses F, which uses E? Uh, something like that, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's it, cool. Cool, I like it. Okay, next thing is probably, um, okay, no, I think I like this. So let's add, let's add a service to our application. We figured out templating, that's fine. So services. So how is this going to look like in 2.0? Well, I think Mishko showed you some of this, but. It, Let's take a look. Um, it's greatly simplified because all we need to do is specify a class. So in this case, let's add a persistent storage to application. So we have a to-do store. It's just a class, ECMAScript like 6 class, that has a constructor. Uh, because of dependency injection, we can say we need a window in this particular class, and the window will be provided to a constructor using DI. And then we have the user rule uh, API interface defined using properties and methods that then the rest of the application can use to interact with the service. OK, that's nice. So next thing is probably we take the service and register it in an angular.module, right? Come on. <laughs> okay. Yes, Tobias, we killed angular module as well. Um, because we now ha can use ECMAScript 6 modules, we don't need a custom module system anymore. So what we can do when we want to use this particle service, we can just import the to-do store um, using the standard ECMAScript 6 uh, syntax. And then in the, in the Santa app, um, we can inject the to-do store into the constructor, just like we usually do with dependency injection. OK, I like this. OK, cool. Cool, DI. So when I think about DI, I also, also directives come to my mind. You know, you have multiple directives, and they interact with each other when I get a hold of the other. You know, you have this controller and this require statement, and then it gets kind of in the fourth argument of the link function. A little bit weird, but it's kind of DI for directives as well. Did you do something about that? Yeah, so, well, since we removed the directive definition object, um, we enhanced the DI to take over the responsibility of getting a hold of other components. Okay, so. Do you want to talk about the tap container and tap pane scenario? Oh, that's a good example. Right, right. We, have, we actually have this. So, for tap container, you know what the problem is. The tap container, it's outside. And the problem with it is that it needs information from the tab pane. So the tab pane defines which buttons the tab container should render. The title is on the tab pane, and also the number of tab panes define the buttons down there. So all, all this down is defined by the tab panes. So they need to communicate together, right? So how do you do this in 2.0 now? Well, since 2.0, uh, in the DI in 2.0 uh, is actually understands the structure of our components. One thing we can do is, um, in the case of tab pane that is trying to get hold of the parent tab container, in the constructor, you can just say, please provide me the nearest tab container. And the DI will just figure out which one is the nearest tab container and will provide it. So you don't need to do any require, any special magic. You will just get it through the constructor. In a similar way, since we don't have the linking function and we don't need it anymore, uh, if you want to get hold of the element of the current um, component, all you need to do is specify that you want HTML element, and the nearest HTML element for this directive will be provided to you. Okay. And while well, this is like tab pane wants to get hold of tab container, you know, the other way around was previously a little hacky. How's that working out? Well, we actually have this really cool mechanism, um, which we call query mechanism. Uh, what that allows you to do is, in the case of tab container trying to get hold of the child components, you can specify that you have a dependency on the panes and you're actually querying the panes. The result of this is that a collection object will be injected into your tab container constructor and this collection will contain all of the child components that match the tab pane. Um, the cool thing about this is that if new panes are added or old ones are removed, or even if the panes are reordered, you will be notified of these changes so that you always know what, what's the current state of your children. All right, and we talked about scope and events. So this could also 
be the same as a broadcast for events down to the children, right? Yes. So this can actually completely replace the broadcast mechanism, uh, which is better because you can directly interact with the children you want to talk to. Uh, and we find that this method of communication is much more reliable than events. It's very simple to just make a typo in the event name and nobody hears about your event. But with this mechanism, if you don't um, spe properly specify whom you want to talk to, you will get errors right away and you will be able to debug it and fix it quickly. Okay, this will solve so many problems for me. I love it. <laughs> it's cool. So, okay, so many things, cool. Oh wait, there's one more thing actually. So, you know Santa, he's a really nice guy. He, he really is, really trust me, he's not. But there's actually one thing that, that he's, I don't know. So when he's on his sleigh and he's riding and he's on a run and wants to deliver all those packages, he can get so impatient, you know? He takes out his cell phone and if it takes just a little bit longer than he expected it, he gets really mad. And then he takes snowballs and throws them at his reindeers, those poor reindeers. Can, can we do something about that? That sucks. We should definitely help those reindeers. Um, there are many things we can do about performance, and performance overall is a very complex topic, so we don't have, to, we cannot really cover it all. But do you have some suggestions about what we could do in Angular to make Angular faster? I actually have. So, you know, the other day I made a JS perf, and there I compared the for in loop in JavaScript with a new for off loop of ES6, and in my browser it turns out the for in loop is faster. So I think if you just all, never use the for off loop, always the for in loop, I think we should be fine. Really? Okay, that's an interesting suggestion. Well, one thing that we learned while we were improving uh, performance in 1.3 is that performance is really not a single or one-time task. It's really a process that you have to go through and you have to build into your development cycle. And this process has several stages. We usually uh, just measure, we try to analyze what's going on and then we improve. And we have to bake this process into the development cycle so that things get faster and faster okay, and faster. Okay, 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 <laughs> yeah, I think I know what you... <laughs> Okay, that's cool, so I, I like this. So for the first step is measuring, right? And yesterday we heard about bench press. It's a new tool we also already used for 1.3. Yep. So, so the cool thing that? about bench press is that it allows us to benchmark real world, real world uh, scenarios. It's very easy to just say, like in your case, that we have a uh, four off is faster than four in, but in most cases, it doesn't really matter. When it does matter is when you're dealing with a hot code path, and identifying this hot code path is only possible if you have real world scenarios that are trying to benchmark. And BenchPress is a really good tool to discovering these hot paths and then trying to micro-optimize those paths if possible. Okay, so micro bench, micro changes. So what, are, what would be micro-optimizations? Yes, so in general, I actually prefer micro-optimizations over micro-optimizations because micro-optimizations can only give you like 10, 20, maybe 30% uh, improvement in the hot code path. But macro-optimizations can easily give you 2x, 3x, or even more. Okay, so do you have an example? I have two examples. So while we were working on 1.3, we realized that JQ Lite and jQuery in general were becoming a bottleneck in, in Angular. So we tried to micro-optimize JQLite as much as we could, but um, we realized that it would be better not to use DOM wrappers inside of the framework at all. Okay, so I know what is coming. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so in 2.0, we're not gonna use DOM wrappers inside of the framework at all. Um, we're just going to deal with raw DOM. Uh, the DOM has improved quite a bit since we started, so we don't actually need a compatibility layer that will help us uh, with the different browsers as much as we used to need it. So we can just deal with raw DOM. But if you want to deal with, uh, if you want to use jQuery, if you find jQuery useful in new components, you can totally use that. That's totally fine. Okay. There is another example that I want to bring up, which is uh, leveraging imperative over declarative programming. So as Wait, we you mean the other way around. Leveraging declarative over imperative, yes. <laughs> as we saw, many of the examples that we show you today, they, they were very declarative. We were declaring classes, we were declaring annotations, 
And thanks to these um, declarative information, we can actually understand what you're trying to do without running the code. This is, this is a big difference compared to Angular 1, where we often need to run code to figure out what is it that you were trying to do. And once we can understand the code and your intentions up front, we can better analyze templates. And not only we can help you as you develop, but we can also do performance optimizations that were not possible before. So this is one of the big things that is coming to Angular 2. Cool. So let's, let's finally look into the Analyze tab a little closer. You know, the other day, I did a flame chart in DevTools, and they are really cool. Like, they show you where time is spent. But if I build an app together with Angular, I have this problem that there's my code and Angular's code, and it's hard to tell where the, where the time is spent. So do you have some help with this? Yeah, flame charts are pretty cool, but they're kind of hard to interpret if you're dealing with a code that uses application code and framework code. Because in these situations, um, the code is often intermixed, and it's really hard to tell what's going on just by looking at the stack trace. There is a lot of contextual information that is missing. And one experiment we did in 1.3, we, we used web tracing framework to instrument Angular uh, to give us more information about what was going on at runtime. And one of the results was this flame chart. Uh, it's kind of similar to what we saw um, before, but instead of using a stack trace, this is just a subset and actually tells us more about what was going on um, during the lifetime of the application. So in this case, we know that the user clicked uh, on some button um, in a digest started. We can actually tell that we were in the digest loop and we're now in the second iteration of the digest loop. Uh, it's zero based, and that's why it shows one. And during the digest loop, a watcher triggered, and, during, and the watcher means that some model was dirty, uh, so we responded to the change. And in the response to this change, we started to compiling a template and instantiate a view. And what is really cool is that we can actually see what view was being instantiated. So we can see that it was some span with ng-bind. And we know that this was the operation that was taking longer than many of the other watches. So we can go back and we can optimize uh, this particular scenario. This is something that Flamechart will never be able to tell you because it doesn't have the contextual information without the help of the uh, framework. So maybe sometime we'll, we'll get this directly built into the flame chart, but in the main, meantime, tools like web tracing framework can help us to get this information and see it. Okay, wow. I'm really looking forward to the, all, all of this, those changes. So let's recap. What did we have? So well, we started off with the generic binding syntax, so we don't have wrapper directives anymore, and we can work with web components out of the box. Yes, this means that we don't need controllers because we are embracing the component model. Um, so you're going to be building components rather than just directives and templates. Okay, we don't have the directive definition object, but instead we use annotations and we have three different kinds of annotations to help us simplify the use cases. But we are still generic, right? ng-repeat is still not built into the platform. That's cool. So we also got rid of scope because the execution context of the templates is the component instance itself. And we can use a DI query mechanism to get hold of any of the child components that we need to talk to. Okay, we killed angular.module. Instead, we rely on ES6 module loader or other module loaders to directly get hold of types and then use them directly. And um, when we're talking about optimizations, we're not going to use jQLite anymore. Uh, you can use jQuery if you want to in your components, but the framework is just going to deal with raw DOM. And um, when it comes to performance, we are building that into a process of developing Angular with tools like BenchPress that will help us better understand the real world uh, situations. And if you have something that is particularly slow, uh, I encourage you to send us a benchmark that we can add to a test suite and, and optimize it and make sure that we don't have any performance regressions. And lastly, um, we're gonna build in instrumentation into the framework so that you get information about what is happening during the runtime and what can you do about making the application faster. Wow, this was great. Thank you so much, Igor, for taking the time to explain Angular 2.0 to me. And thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. <laughs>